on the morning of January 25th, 2019. Liz Barraza, a 29-year-old beloved wife and daughter, set up a garage sale in the driveway of her Tomball, Texas home. Just before 7 a.m., a suspect driving a dark Nissan Frontier truck parked across the street, exited the vehicle, and swiftly approached Liz in the driveway. The suspect then shot Liz four times before sprinting back to the truck and fleeing the scene. Despite a surveillance camera capturing the entire incident, the police have yet to identify the suspect. It's been just over five years since Liz was killed, and investigators are still searching for the person responsible. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective. And each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. And if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing, whether you're watching right now on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever platform you use. Okay, you just heard the teaser for Liz Barraza. It's a pretty self-explanatory uh, opening. There's really not too much, like I guess, like hidden traps to this one. There, There is a mystery, obviously. That's why we're covering it. I think the uniqueness of this case in particular compared to our other cases that we've covered on Detective Perspective is the fact that we have the entire crime caught on film. This is the first time we really have this. And not only do we have it, but we have it from multiple angles. Although one angle, you can't see much, but you can hear a lot. And we're going to play both of those clips tonight for you. Um, discretion. I, the first one specifically, you can see the murder, although it's in the distance. Um, but it, for those of you who may be sensitive to that, just a little bit of a warning. And I'll give you it again as we go through the episode. But we're not the first ones to cover this case. I know Kendall Ray has covered it. Uh, I believe Investigation Discovery has covered it as well. Um, so really with this one, what we're trying to do is just give some more exposure to a case that you would think would be solved by this point. But we've talked a lot about it. I'm giving you some of the things to come. Let's not waste any more time. Let's dive right into the case. Elizabeth Marie Nelly, known as Liz, was born on June 26, 1989, to Bob and Rosemary. Her parents described her as someone who always saw the best in people. Liz was generous, thoughtful, and she always aimed to make a positive impact on others. After graduating from high school in 2008, Liz attended Sam Houston State University. During her time there, Liz met and started dating Sergio Barraza. They connected over their shared passion for Harry Potter and Star Wars, as well as their love for creating costumes. In 2012, Liz graduated from Sam Houston State University with a bachelor's degree in psychology. Less than two years later, on February 1, 2014, Liz and Sergio married. Liz went on to work for the Rosen Group as a data reporter while Sergio worked for his father as a crew chief installing flooring. Liz and Sergio were also members of the 501st Legion, a group of volunteers who dressed up in costumes from Star Wars and would visit children in hospitals in the Houston area. In 2016, the couple purchased a home in the 8600 block of Cedar Walk Drive. The house was in the Princeton Place subdivision located in Tomball, a suburb of Houston. Neighbors described Liz and Sergio as friendly and welcoming people who always said hi. By the time early 2019 rolled around, Liz and Sergio were preparing to celebrate their fifth wedding anniversary. According to Who Killed Liz Barraza, a website run by Liz's parents, the couple planned a trip to Orlando to celebrate. They were supposed to leave on Sunday, January 27th. On Thursday, January 24th, Liz spontaneously decided to host a garage sale to raise extra money for souvenirs on their trip. The sale was scheduled for Friday the 25th, 
and Saturday the 26th. On Thursday evening, Sergio and Liz placed a few garage sale signs in the neighborhood. They didn't advertise the sale on social media, but they did tell a few friends and family. Liz also called her job to take Friday off while Sergio still had plans to work. On Friday the 25th, at around 6.10 a.m., Liz drove to the local Starbucks to get a coffee. Less than 10 minutes later, she returned home and began setting up for the garage sale with Sergio. Then just after 6.45 a.m., Sergio left for work and Liz continued getting ready for the sale. At 6.53 a.m., a neighbor across the street called 911, reporting four gunshots and a dark-colored Nissan Frontier leaving the Barraza house. While still on the call, the neighbor mentioned the Frontier now driving back by the house. Five minutes later, first responders arrived. Officers secured the scene while EMS called for a life flight. After the helicopter arrived, Liz was airlifted to the hospital in very critical condition. Officers entered Liz's house to clear and secure it. They didn't find anyone inside, but they did trigger an alarm Liz had set to alert her in case the door was opened. At that moment, Liz's parents were notified by the alarm company about the triggered alarm. After calling Liz and getting no response, they hurried to her home, arriving just after 7.30 a.m. Upon discovering that Liz had been shot and taken to the hospital, Rosemary and Bob went to see their daughter, who was eventually placed on life support. Meanwhile, Sergio also received the alarm notification. He checked his ring doorbell live feed and noticed police tape and officers. Sergio then started going through the saved footage to see if he could figure out what was going on. He found a video capturing Liz screaming as gunshots rang out. Now Sergio could only hear what was going on because the camera angle prevented him from seeing the events. He immediately rushed home. When Sergio arrived, he was detained by law enforcement for questioning. He explained that he left the house just after 6.45 a.m. and went to work. He also showed the police the ring doorbell footage of the gunshots and Liz screaming. While the actual shooting wasn't captured, the video told police that at 6.52 a.m., Liz said good morning to someone who had likely approached her in the driveway. For the next six or so seconds, nothing else can be heard until three quick shots ring out and Liz screams multiple times. A few seconds pass and another shot rings out. The screaming stops, and seconds later, a dark-colored Nissan Frontier speeds off. Now, after Sergio was released from questioning, he and his mom went to the hospital. The police continued processing the scene. They didn't find any murder weapon or spent shell casings, leading police to theorize that the killer used a revolver to avoid leaving evidence. The police were able to recover one round that was embedded in the house. They later told Investigation Discovery that it was a small to medium-sized caliber possibly a 380. The police further noticed that the killer didn't steal a cash box with $100 inside, which meant that robbery was most likely not the motive for Liz's murder. The police then started canvassing the neighborhood, hoping to find someone who witnessed the shooting. They didn't find anyone who saw the actual shooting, but they did learn that the neighbor across the street had a security camera pointed right at the Barraza home. The police immediately retrieved the footage and were able to locate a video of the shooting which showed a Nissan Frontier park across the street from the Barraza home at 6.52 a.m. The killer left the car running and exited the driver's side door. They walked in front of the car's headlights and quickly went up to Liz, who was setting up things for the garage sale in the driveway. Now, I'm gonna play the video for you of the shooting, and as I said in the opening, it's, it's blurry, I wish it wasn't. Um, you can definitely see the shooting, although it's in the distance, so just to warn you, it could be considered graphic to some. Um, there is no audio for this clip, so if you're listening on audio, I do apologize. You may have a minute or two or of blank sound, or maybe I can have Shannon cut that out for the audio version. But for the video version, we're gonna play that clip now. Now, due to the video's quality, the police couldn't make out a clear description of the killer. However, they noticed that the suspect was wearing knee-high light-colored boots, possibly a muumuu dress, a long jacket or robe, and maybe a wig. 
The killer's gender wasn't certain, but it was evident they were wearing a disguise. After the killer approached Liz in the driveway, they pulled out a gun. Liz flinched and stepped back. The killer spoke to her for about six seconds, but unfortunately the exact words are unknown. Then, three quick shots were fired. After Liz collapsed, the suspect stood over her and fired a fourth shot, point blank. An autopsy later revealed that the first shot went through the side of Liz's neck, exiting and hitting the house. The next two shots were in her chest, and the final shot was in her face. After shooting Liz four times, the killer sprinted back to their Nissan Frontier truck and drove off. The entire incident lasted about 30 seconds. Liz's murder had been very calculated and cold-blooded. It was obvious from the video that she had been targeted. The police later told Investigation Discovery that they were struck by how brazen the murder was. The killer had to know that there was a chance someone could have witnessed the shooting. It was almost 7 a.m. on a weekday, meaning people in the neighborhood could have been leaving for work. The police reviewed surveillance footage from the surrounding areas and they were able to put together a more detailed timeline of the Nissan Frontier's movements. At approximately 2 a.m. on January 25th, the Nissan Frontier drove by Liz's home leading police to believe that the killer could have been casing the house. On the morning of the incident at 6.47 a.m., the Frontier pulled into the Barraza's neighborhood and drove into the Gartered School parking lot. One minute later, the truck left the school parking lot and drove to a different street. At that exact time, Sergio left home to go to work. Just three minutes later, at 6.51 a.m., the Nissan Frontier drove toward the Barraza home. KPRC2 reported that due to the frontier moving so quickly after Sergio left the house, the police theorized that the killer was waiting for Sergio to leave. This also meant that the killer would have had to have known what kind of car Sergio was driving. Furthermore, the killer had to know that Liz was going to be home alone instead of on her way to work like she normally would be doing on a Friday morning. At 6.52 a.m., the truck did a three-point turn on the Barraza street before parking across the Barraza home. The killer exited the truck, went to the driveway, shot Liz, and then got back into the truck and took off. Now here's the interesting thing. At 6.55 a.m., the truck exited the subdivision, but then did a U-turn to re-enter the neighborhood and drove back by Liz's house. Now based on this move, the police believe the killer wanted to make sure that Liz was dead. One detective later said, quote, I feel they contacted somebody and said, hey, the job's done. And then that person said, are you sure? And they turned around and drove by the scene one more time. The video of the shooting and the truck traveling around the neighborhood was released almost immediately to the public in the hopes that someone could help identify the suspect or the truck. The lead detective later told Investigation Discovery that he thought they'd have the case solved by the end of the day. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Now, while the police continued their investigation, Liz's family was by her side at the hospital. On Saturday, January 26th, Elizabeth Barraza was pronounced dead. Now, I think it's important to note that Liz had chosen to be an organ donor, and as a result, her heart, liver, both kidneys, and corneas were donated. She ended up saving four lives and gave another the gift of sight. Now, as the family began planning Liz's funeral, the police tried identifying the killer's truck, which had already been identified as a dark-colored 2013 to 2019 Nissan Frontier Pro 4X model with four doors and a crew cab. The police looked at hundreds of vehicles that matched the truck, but they didn't have any luck identifying the one seen on the videos. The police eventually asked Sergio and Liz's parents to watch the surveillance footage they had obtained. Bob said hearing Liz say good morning to the killer told him that she didn't know them, she probably assumed they were there for the garage sale until she saw the gun. Rosemary said that seeing Liz step back after she saw the gun was the worst part of the video. She knew that Liz was afraid at that moment, and it destroyed Rosemary to see her daughter like that. And unfortunately, Liz's parents and Sergio did not recognize the killer or the truck in the video. On February 6th, Crime Stoppers of Houston hosted a press conference to announce a reward of $20,000. Bob spoke at the conference stating, quote, A coward drove up, approached my daughter, and forever changed our lives. An unknown assailant shot and killed an unarmed and defenseless woman in a brutal act that demands justice. We never imagined a life without her. We still can't. Sergio also spoke stating, quote, 
My wife Liz was a beautiful person with the kindest of souls. Tragically, someone stole that away from us on the morning of January 25th. I don't understand how someone could do this to her. She didn't deserve to pass away like this. How someone could be so monstrous to commit an act like this, I just really can't understand. I had to trade our fifth anniversary for a funeral. We need justice for Liz. I need justice for Liz. I love you, Liz. Unfortunately, the press conference didn't bring in the leads police were looking for, so they continued on with their investigation. In order to narrow down the suspect pool, the police concentrated on identifying someone who knew the following, where Liz lived, what Sergio's car looked like and what time he left for work, and that Liz would be hosting a garage sale by herself instead of going to work. The suspect also had to know where to park and how to approach Liz to avoid being captured by the Barraza's ring doorbell camera. To start, the police worked on coming up with a list of people who knew about the garage sale. Because Liz didn't post about the sale on social media and she only put up signs, that made the pool of people pretty small. The police found out that Liz's co-workers all knew about the sale since she had taken the day off from work, but all of the co-workers were accounted for at work at the time of the shooting. That just left Sergio and a few friends and family that knew about the sale, and as expected, the police focused their investigation on Sergio since he was Liz's husband. At this point, the police knew Sergio couldn't be the killer because he was on his way to work when the shooting happened and he didn't fit the suspect description, but they wondered if it was possible he hired someone to kill Liz. The police told Investigation Discovery that they were suspicious of Sergio for more reasons than just him being her husband. They actually found his behavior unusual after he arrived at the house on the morning of the murder. When he showed them the ring doorbell footage, he displayed no emotional response and remained unaffected by the sound of his wife's screams during the shooting. A conversation between Sergio and an officer was recorded by one officer's patrol car, and in the video, Sergio can be heard saying, quote, Oh my god, dude, this is crazy. So they just fucking shot her and left? Now, some people have pointed to this video as further evidence that Sergio didn't have the typical response you would expect in a situation like this. Another thing that police had noticed was that after they released Sergio from detainment and allowed him to leave the scene, he didn't seem in a hurry to get to the hospital. He stuck around the house to talk to neighbors and the media. All of this behavior struck the police as odd. Sergio didn't fit the profile of a distressed husband who just found out that his wife had been shot four times in the driveway. Thinking Sergio could have something to do with Liz's murder, the police asked him about Liz's life insurance. He said that Liz had life insurance through her work, but he didn't think the amount was very high. The police looked into the policy and learned that she was actually worth quite a bit, $250,000. And if Liz died by an accident or murder, the policy would double to be worth $500,000. The police looked into Sergio and Liz's relationship further and tried to find if there were any signs of trouble or an affair. But after speaking to friends and family and scouring Liz and Sergio's phones, they found no signs of any issues. In fact, it seemed like they were a young couple having the time of their lives. But just to be sure they weren't missing anything, the police also looked into Sergio's bank records. And as far as we know, they found no unusual financial transactions before or after Liz's murder. The police also asked Sergio to take a polygraph test and he agreed. They later told Investigation Discovery that he passed the test, however, the police have never ruled Sergio out as a suspect. They have stated they won't rule anyone out until they find the killer. With Sergio no longer looking like the top suspect, the police decided to look at the video of the shooting again and noticed that the killer was wearing knee-high, light-colored boots, almost like what someone dressed up as a stormtrooper would be wearing. The police spoke with Sergio and asked if anyone at the 501st group had a grudge against Liz and would want her dead, but he couldn't think of anyone. The police vetted every member of the group anyway, but didn't identify any suspects. By November of 2019, the police hadn't determined any motive for Liz's murder. Despite this, the lead detective told the media that he believed more than one person was involved. He didn't elaborate further. Now, real quickly, I, I don't know what to take from this. I always say this, I don't have access to the entire case. I think what he's trying to say, if I'm reading between the lines, is that he believes the person who actually shot Liz was either doing this for someone else or because of someone else. And I'll 
kind of get into that a little bit here, I guess. It's one of those situations where you want to point out the obvious. Either this person was hired by someone to kill Liz or because of something that Liz was involved in or because of someone Liz was involved with, this person wanted her dead. It was more advantageous for Liz to no longer be in the, pic in the picture. What, do I, what am I saying by that? Just not to be cryptic. If Sergio was dating someone else, maybe this person was the individual that Sergio was dating. And in order for Sergio and her to be together, uh, she shot Liz. And I'm saying this because it's not a strong theory, but I will say that there are people when I've been reading some stuff online who have suggested, and I'm not even going to say her name, but uh, Sergio's new wife uh, kind of fits the description of the person in the video. But as I said earlier, the person in the video may be wearing a disguise for that purpose to throw off what they really look like. So I don't put too much weight in it, but I also don't discredit it. But to kind of bring this back to the point of what the detective said, sure, it looks like this person had an ax to grind with Liz because of someone and that someone would know who this person was or just straightforward, this person was hired by another individual to kill Liz. Now, by January 25th, 2020, one year had passed since Liz was murdered. Her family spoke with ABC 13 to mark the somber occasion. Liz's father, Bob, said the shock and horror of Liz's murder made no sense. He added that even if they learn who the killer is and why Liz was killed, to them, the why will never make sense. Sergio described the shooting as the worst day of his life. He said he and Liz should still be together and they should be talking about planning their next anniversary trip. The lead detective also spoke to the media and said there was now a warrant in the case, but he didn't explain what the warrant was for. All he said was, quote, I feel the result of the warrant will be critical in the investigation and most likely will expose a suspect and who's responsible for this. Unfortunately, it looks like he was wrong. By January 2021, two years had passed since Liz was murdered. The police provided an update stating they had identified some suspects but we're still working on others. They also released new footage in the case. It was the video that Sergio found on the home's ring doorbell camera. All right, now before I play this video, two things. First off, it, you don't see anything, but you definitely hear Liz being shot and her screaming. So just a warning about that. Secondly, your human nature is gonna be to turn this volume all the way up to try to hear what Liz and the suspect are saying to each other. Refrain from doing that initially. The gunshots are very, very loud. And if you're wearing head headphones, it will hurt your ears. I know this because I did it to mine the first time through. So take my advice. Don't turn it up right away. Listen or watch the video and then decide the volume control from there. But I'm going to play the clip now and we'll get right back into it. All right, so like we were just talking about, the shooting wasn't caught on the camera due to the angle, but the camera did capture the Nissan Frontier driving by the house multiple times. This video also had a clearer photo of the truck than had been previously released, so the police asked people to focus on looking at the truck. They were hoping someone who knew something would see the video and finally come forward. The police also had a direct message for the killer. They said, quote, I hope you can't sleep at night, and that you know we are never going to stop looking for Liz's murderer. There is no time limit on this case. For the next year, Rosemary and Bob continued advocating for Liz's case and raising money to increase the reward. They also set up a website titled Who Killed Liz Barraza to share information about who Liz was, the facts of the case, and tip line info. Now in January of 2022, three years had passed since Liz was killed. Bob and Rosemary told the media they still weren't sure why Liz was killed and they couldn't think of anyone who would want to hurt her. Bob and Rosemary said they were going to keep fighting for justice in Liz's case no matter how long it took. 
They wanted to get the killer off the street and get justice for their daughter because she deserves that. That month, a press conference was held and a $50,000 reward was announced. Sergio spoke at the conference stating, quote, I just hope this helps, and I hope someone steps up. We need somebody to do the right thing. We need justice for Liz, and we hope to get that this year. The police also provided an update stating the case was still active and detectives had just gone to Miami to interview a person of interest. However, they needed more tips in order to solve this case. By January of 2023, four years had passed, so Bob and Rosemary sat down with a news outlet for an interview. Bob said that he wouldn't wish the last four years of their life on anybody, but at the end of the day, all they care about are the people that did this getting caught and kept from ever doing this to another family. Bob and Rosemary also spoke about Liz and Sergio's relationship. Bob said they were two wonderful people, and when they were together, they were even better. Rosemary added, quote, Liz was such a kind person. Maybe somebody was jealous of her. Maybe they were jealous of Sergio and Liz's relationship. Sergio, who had recently remarried, also sat down for an interview with the same news outlet. He said a lot of people consider him the prime suspect in Liz's death, but he wasn't involved. He stated, quote, I know people immediately say it was the husband who did it. I understand that, but you had to know Liz and I. You had to see us. I still love her to this day. Liz was amazing. It was like a fairy tale that we had together. In December of 2023, the FBI and Texas Rangers joined the investigation. The lead detective told the media that the added agency's expertise and resources would allow them to further examine evidence and jump on new leads. He believes that they are closer than ever to solving Liz's murder, but it's going to take that one person who knows something to come forward. The detective also stated that over the years, the police have gathered new evidence. However, he could not go into detail about what that evidence was. Now, unfortunately, this is the last update we have in this case. The police are still searching for the killer, and Liz's family remains desperate for answers. All right, so let's get into the perspective. And again, just want to always qualify this. I'm going off what I can see, what I can hear, what I know about this case, and I obviously don't have access to the case files. And if I did, I may feel differently. But going off what we know, let's talk about the, the murder itself first. Because we do have that. We do have the video. We do have the audio. And there are things that you can take away from what you can see and hear that are indisputable. They're fact. We can see that it was deliberate. We can see that it was intentional. And I think it's fairly easy to deduce that with a high degree of certainty that Liz was the target. No doubt about it. She was the target. And the intent was to kill her, wasn't to send a message, wasn't to inquire about something, wasn't to steal something from her, it was to kill her. How do we know that? Well, as I said in the earlier description of the case, we know that obviously she was killed on January 25th, but also there's strong evidence through surveillance that she was, that the house was cased before that. And that tells us that these individuals or this individual was gathering intelligence, was, was getting familiar with the, su the surroundings, was trying to understand the best way to get in there and get out of there without being seen or heard from, which is a whole different thing because on the surface, you would think that this was a professional hit, that this was a, so, done by someone who had maybe done this before but if that were the case, would they choose to go into a neighborhood that is bound to have numerous cameras, including a camera on the house of the, of the victim? Would they run the risk of going in there with a vehicle that's going to obviously be seen, uh, do what they want to do, and then get out of there? And, and again, 2019, that wasn't too long ago. The technology's there, rings there. On the other side of the coin, you could say maybe the car had been stolen. Maybe it was a, a dump vehicle. Maybe they wore a disguise knowing, hey, we're probably going to get picked up by some cameras, but 
We're going to get rid of this car immediately after the fact so it really doesn't matter and we're going to wear a disguise so that doesn't matter either. But what that could also mean instead of this professional who plotted this whole thing and didn't really care that the car was going to be seen on camera, this could be an indication that it was personal, that it was emotional, that this person was not a professional and just wanted Liz dead. For whatever reason, we don't know, but they just wanted her dead and they were so angry with something she had done or said or been a part of that they just they wanted to kill her. Okay, we can acknowledge that's a possibility. We haven't seen any signs of it or, or indications why someone would want to do that, but maybe there's something we don't know. So we'll put that on the table as well. It could have been a professional hit. It could have been a personal attack. Either way, you pick your poison. Both situations, the intent was to kill her, not to wound her, not to take something from her, not to scare her. They shot her four times. And on the fourth shot, as I described in the story, and as you've seen with your own eyes, they stood over her and shot her in the head to ensure that she was going to die. And if that wasn't enough, which we don't see very often, the killer returned to the crime scene moments later just to double check that she was no longer moving and that most likely she was already deceased. She wasn't, but that was their hope that, hey, she's gone. Let me double check. And they went back. That also, to me, doesn't sound like a professional someone who would go back. But again, maybe they're not a good professional. That's always possible. So where are we now with this case and who should we be potentially looking at? Well, for one, they looked at coworkers and apparently they were all accounted for by that time. If that's the case, I have to take them at their word. But I would go back to neighbors. Uh, the neighbors weren't all accounted for. And we talked about her not, or Sergio and, and, and Liz not putting this garage sale on social media, but they did put out signs in the area. And when I say neighborhood and neighbors, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone who lives on that street. It could be someone from a street over. And the question becomes, has she had any issues with people in the past? You'd be amazed at what people can hold on to. Did they have a dispute over a dog or a piece of property, or I, I don't know, some stupid trivial thing that one of these individuals held on to and decided to do this for whatever reason. I'm saying this, by the way, knowing that it's a, it's a long shot. More than likely, it's not the reason, but I'm giving you options. I'm giving different scenarios for the sake of being objective and open to all possibilities. How can I cross something off the board if it hasn't been completely ruled out. And for me, it hasn't. There are people in that community who were aware that there was going to be a garage sale on the on that morning. And could one of them have had an ax to grind? Sure. But let me also throw something at you. What if it's someone who is just a psychotic person, a potential serial killer, and has been wanting to do something like this for a long time? They've had this itch they've wanted to scratch forever. And they see the situation, they know when the husband's leaving, or they at least think they know when the husband's leaving. They know there's a garage sale. They've been maybe watching Liz for a while. And may, yeah, maybe they don't personally know her, but for some reason they're drawn to her. Could this be a random act of violence? Could this be someone who had no personal connection and was not hired by anyone, but just was looking for the right person and the right time to kill? And it's as simple as that. All these serial killers we've had from the past, they don't usually have a connection, a personal connection to their victims. They find someone who's a victim of opportunity that fits the bill, that fits whatever they're looking for, that maybe puts that victim in a situation where they feel they can get away with it and they do what they want to do. It could be that simple and that could be the explanation as to why law enforcement has not caught this person yet. But let's talk about what a lot of people are talking about, and that's Sergio. He himself has acknowledged that human nature is to say the husband did it. But it's not only human nature. Law enforcement has also said that his behavior after the incident was very suspicious. And based on what we've been told, I would agree with that. But that could be a personality trait. Maybe that's a form of shock. Maybe that's how he dealt with the trauma that he was experiencing. But on the surface, I agree. Suspicious, uncharacteristic for someone who just saw or heard his wife being brutally murdered on camera. 
But again, let's just give them the benefit of the doubt there. Now tack on to it that you do have a potential motive. Finances, right? There was nothing in there to suggest that they were hurting for cash, but who couldn't use an extra half a million dollars? Is there a world where on the surface everything looked good? Is there on the world where there was no infidelity going on behind the scenes, nothing that would be seen by police, but he was not in love with her anymore and wanted to remove her from the equation and wanted the money? Is that possible? I'd be remiss if I said it wasn't. Of course it's possible. And it's a plausible scenario based on what we've talked about so far. Am I saying he's guilty of that? Absolutely not. But I think even Sergio himself, which respect to him, if he's not the person who did this, is saying, listen, I get it. I can see how people are getting there, but you didn't know Liz and I. You didn't know our relationship. And he may be right. But I've also done some research on this case before sitting down and recording, and I know the popular opinion online, and trust me, I take it with a grain of salt, is that Sergio was involved. A lot of people believe that, and they have even gone a step further to say that his now wife, and again, not going to say her name, fits the description of this of this woman that was in a, that they believe might have been a woman who shot Liz. Fits the description of her. Well, that's that's a hard thing to do because again, we law enforcement has even said they believe that the suspect was wearing some type of disguise potentially, but maybe they weren't. So, I try to read between the lines when we think about where the case is now and what law enforcement has said. Well, for one, the fact that they're releasing more information to the public as of late, unfortunately tells me they're not as close as they would like to be. Because if they were really on the trail, they wouldn't feel the need to reach out to the public. There's some, they need more. They, they're not there yet. They may have some theories, they may be strong in nature, but they're not there yet. And when they say they've gone to places like Miami to, you know, that's a far way away from Texas, it tells me that maybe they're onto something or maybe they're just tracking down leads. And if it is directed back to Miami, that would indicate a potential hit. And if it is a hit, that goes back to the question again. Who would have a reason to kill Liz Barraza? Who would, what would the incentive be? What would someone gain from that? And you would think it would be finances, which is how we circle back to Sergio. But then we talk about the pool that law enforcement created. And I thought it was pretty smart what they did there. It's because you can take, you know, create that Venn diagram, right? Where you have these different circles of people and you want to see which ones overlap. So as they said, you talk about who would know that there was a garage sale that morning. It is a small pool, right? It is a very small pool. And then who would know that Sergio was going to go to work and that Liz was going to stay home because she called out of work to work the garage sale. That Venn diagram right there, just those two groups, very small. That's why everyone's leaning towards Sergio because as they, as we kind of laid out here, the suspect sat down the street for a little while, waited for Sergio to leave, and then attacked Liz. And as you can see on the ring doorbell camera angle, the truck literally drove right by the house, pulled a three-point turn, comes back, and gets out of the car. So this this person was the, was waiting for Sergio to leave. There's no doubt about it. And then finally, like I said two minutes ago, those two circles, right? Who would know that there was a garage sale? Who would know Sergio was going to work? Who would know Liz was going to be home? And who would benefit from Liz no longer being here? There's not many, many people that would check all of those boxes. And so that's why... I think a lot of people end up getting to the the thought, the opinion that Sergio is somehow involved. Where do I stand on it? As far as I'm concerned, he's innocent until proven guilty. He has never been charged with a crime. And although I can say definitively it does not look good for him, there is a world where, as I laid out a few minutes ago, that this murder— of, of Elizabeth is completely unrelated to anyone in her life. As Bob said earlier in this story, it sounds like, and it sounds like it to me too, she says something like good morning, but it's also, I don't know if my mind's playing tricks on me, but it's the way she says it. It doesn't sound like a, like, oh, good morning, like someone she knows. It sounds like a good morning, like, hey, I don't know you, but I'm being polite. That's at least what I picked up from it. I can't 
I don't have the best hearing to begin with. I couldn't get anything else out of it. So to me, it, it did suggest that she didn't know this person. And I've seen some things online where people have said that they've heard, they, they can hear, you know who I am or something like that. There's a lot of different theories out there about what can be heard throughout that recording. I couldn't pick up on anything. But if she really didn't know this person, it's one of two situations, right? It's it's the hitman situation, right? Professional hit taken out on her. Or it's this attacker who knew who Liz was for one reason or another, knew the dynamics of the household, and, and from, somehow knew that morning that Sergio wasn't going to be around and that there was going to be a garage sale. And maybe that person deduced, well, hey, listen, if there's going to be a garage sale, more than likely at least one of the two individuals that live there will be, you know, handling it. And by parking down the street, they were able to do it. The only thing against that is the idea that this would be someone who was from that community and yet they had to drive into the neighborhood. So they weren't too close by unless they, again, we're getting crazy here, but drove down the road, grabbed the, the unmarked vehicle, came back in to make it look like it was someone who wasn't from the community when in fact they were. And I'll also say with serial killers, it's usually not like this, but it's not completely impossible. We've had many other cases where you have an individual who's sick in the head and is going around and shooting homeless people for no reason, no connection to him whatsoever, just for the thrill of it. So could that be the situation here? Absolutely. And that's that's kind of where I stand on this one. And to, to really make it clear, I don't feel good about Sergio, but I don't necessarily think with a high degree of certainty that it's him. I'm just saying, looking at the facts, it, it doesn't look good. Optically on the surface, it doesn't look good. And I think even he would admit it from an outside's perspective looking in, it does not look great. And I'll also say on that same note, if someone came out tomorrow and there was an arrest and it was a person who was unrelated to Sergio or Liz, and there was no connection as far as a, a hiring of this person and that we learned that this individual had killed multiple people other than Liz just for the sake of doing it, I would not be surprised in the least. So I will say to everyone out there, although things may not look good for certain individuals, don't assume just because it looks like it could be the case that it is. As I said before, there's been many times where you'll check six or seven boxes, but once you get to that eighth box, it just doesn't fit. And when that happens in an investigation, you have to go back, unfortunately, and start from square one, regardless of how demoralizing that might be. Welcome to the world of investigations. So that's where we are. We're covering this case, and we're doing it to get the word out there about Liz's death. And as Bob said in a, a quote earlier in this episode, they don't only want to take this person off the street for what they did to Liz. They want to prevent them from doing it to anyone else. And that's where I come back to the whole potential serial killer th scenario. So I completely agree with him. We don't know how many deaths this person is responsible for. So we're going to cover it here. Hopefully there's someone out there who maybe knows something. I don't think anything from the video or audio is going to be taken away from this or analyzed in a way where they, they point something out that uh, a million sets of eyes haven't already looked at and, and hasn't been able to pull anything out of it yet, but you never know. So as always, if you know something or you know someone who knows something, please come forward with that information. And just so you know exactly what we're talking about here tonight on Detective Perspective, I'm going to give you a quick recap. So Liz Barraza was shot four times in the driveway of her Tomball, Texas home on January 25th, 2019. The suspect was wearing a disguise and driving a dark colored 2013 to 2019 Nissan Frontier Pro 4X model with four doors and a crew cab. If you have any information, please contact Crime Stoppers at 713-222-TIPS or the Harris County Sheriff's Office at 713-221-6000. And just remember, there is a $50,000 reward. And lastly, I want to send my thoughts to Bob, Rosemary, and Sergio. They deserve justice. And hopefully with the FBI and the Texas Rangers now joining this investigation, with those added resources, maybe we'll get over that hump and finally answer who killed Elizabeth Barraza. Her family deserves it. She deserves it. And that community deserves it. So if you know anything, please reach out. And last but not least, I want to talk about 
season of justice. But this will be the last episode I cover this in. When we started this, I asked you guys to help me raise $1,000. We surpassed that almost immediately and we're very close to $1,500 at this point. And season of justice actually reached out to me, the people over there and said how surprised they were that we were able to raise that money so quickly. And that, that's a testament to you guys and your support for me and this channel and what we're trying to do. So I don't know the exact number we're at right now, but I want to let you guys know that I want to be part of this. I know the feeling you get by giving back and helping, and we do it all the time on Criminal Coffee, but it's one thing for me to sit up here and ask you guys to donate money. It's another thing to give money myself. So I will also be donating wherever we are right now. It doesn't matter. I will also be donating $500 to this cause to make sure that we get over that hump of $1,500. So again, I want to thank everyone who's already donated. If you would like to donate, the it's right on the screen right here. You can go back and look at that. There's also a text message that you can send. I'll pull that up right now for you. It's detective to 53555. Once again, detective to 53555. And also, if you're watching on YouTube, the website is on the screen right now as well. That's going to do it for me, guys. I appreciate you being here. Everyone stay safe out there. I'll see you soon.